Welcome to the Startup Field Guide, where we learn from successful founders of high-growth startups how their companies truly found product market fit. I'm your host, Sandhya Hegde, and today we'll be diving into the story of Sprig. Sprig is an AI-powered product feedback platform. It helps teams run in-product surveys and session replays with AI-native analysis to help them build better products. Last valued at $330 million, Sprig has hundreds of the largest and fastest growing tech companies in the world as customers, including Notion, Figma, PayPal, Webflow, and Dropbox. Joining us today is Ryan Glasgow, the CEO and founder of Sprig. Welcome to the field guide, Ryan. I'm excited to be here and excited to dig in today. Me too. First of all, congrats on surviving four years as a startup founder. I feel like it's been the most roller coaster ride of a four years in the world that any founder has uh, had to go through. Going back to 2019, could you uh, kick us off by just sharing kind of the origin story of Sprague? How would you describe like your founder? moment of, yes, I need to start a company. I think this is what I'll work on. T take us back. Yeah. And it starts a little bit before 2019. And so my background before Sprig has always been in product management. And I joined four companies pre-product market fit, including companies like Extrabox and Verb. And Extrabox was acquired by Rakuten and Verb was acquired by Snapchat and LifeFire was acquired by Adobe. And when we're helping find product market fit for those early companies, I was constantly looking at my analytics data. At the time, it was mixed panel. This is pre-amplitude. And we're looking at the mixed panel data. And I was constantly having these questions about our users. And I was emailing them little questions. Hey, you used our product. You didn't come back. Hey, you've come back five times. What's working, not working about our product? And that was so paramount and critical to our journey of finding product market fit. And just bear hugging every single user that we got, usually 20 to 50 of these users, pre-launch MVP states of these products. And when I went on to Weebly, we were, it was post-product market fit, but I was still the first product manager. And so mm -hmm. came in, really helped them grow. And in their journey of hyperscale and in their, in their growth journey, to run 50 million accounts when I left. And even from the first few months there, and I quickly realized that old technique that I was using of shooting out short emails, but this time there were tens and thousands of hundreds of thousands of people. And there was a moment where we were looking to, we were really looking to narrow, narrow our focus at Weebly on e-commerce sellers. And we got really specific and hyper-targeted about some of the questions that we had for these sellers. And we looked at our conversion data and we saw the drop off with sellers and we wanted to understand that why question. And like many product teams today, we have incredible granularity thanks to companies like Amplitude. I know you're there in a past life and companies like Mixpanel of exactly what our users are doing with our products. Right. And we have all this data about how much they're paying us and we have all these dashboards around the revenue data and it all goes to these business intelligence tools. But it was really the why questions that I was missing. And I expected more sophisticated tooling at a high growth company like Weebly. I assumed that there was something very focused on these high growth and at scale tech companies to understand the user sentiment and user experience data, just like we had for the behavioral analytical data and the revenue data. And it was such a critical part of our journey scaling Weebly to understand our users and up building a very homegrown rudimentary in product survey solution to understand the key questions around how to improve onboarding conversion or how to reduce churn or how to grow the high value segments of the business. And it took some time off after the acquisition to Square. And I was traveling and I was thinking about some different things to work on. And the one that I kept coming back to was just not having the sophisticated tooling and the robust tooling that I was looking for as a product manager and the other product managers that we believe are also looking for of deeply understanding that user experience data at scale. And so the founding premise from the very beginning at Sprig was how to really empower and support product teams, quickly growing at scale tech companies 
how they can systematically and scalably understand their user experience post product market fit. And I really took those five journeys of doing something manually in those first four experiences to mm -hmm. wanting to do something in a more automated, scalable fashion and not seeing that tooling. And Sprig ended up really being the culmination of my career across those five startup experiences. Nice. I'm curious. I think obviously as investors, when we look at uh, problems like this, we are often the question we try to answer is why now, right? Okay, this is not a new problem. It's been a problem for a while in this form. And there are companies that do surveys, do in-app experiences, right? Maybe not fo not focused on feedbacks. The tech kind of exists and the market kind of exists in some other form. Like, why has uh, no one solved this before? I'm curious, did you, you must have asked that question as soon as you were at Weebly. Given, like, Weebly is a bigger company, has a budget. In hindsight, now having worked on solving this problem, why do you think it had no, no one had taken this approach to it before? When you look at the really the growth of the product team budget, we all know engineering and marketing and sales, very large budgets right. on the P&L statement. And those have typically been areas that investors have invested in. They look at companies like Salesforce and now Datadog and Atlassian, and they're under those three budgets. And 10 years ago, it was very difficult for an investor to be excited about a product management or user research tool. And I think that Mixpanel and Amplitude actually helped grow that budget and helped really expand that addressable market and helped peak the appetite for investors to realize that this could be a hundred million AR plus business. And it helped justify, I think, that product management should have a larger budget than it did. And so I think that was one area is that the budget really started to grow for product teams because right. of the tools are really proving that a larger budget had an outsized impact on the success of the business. No one's going to argue now with having Amplitude or Mixpanel as a part of a product team's budget. It's going to be a required tool of some sorts. The other one is that 10 years ago, Amplitude and Mixpanel were just getting started. And those are the first product analytics solutions. And what dawned on me about having so many questions about the analytical data only emerged until we had the analytical data. And so it was not my first year at Weebly or even second year at Weebly that we're able to get incredibly sophisticated tooling and data and dashboards around our behavioral data and exactly what users are doing with our product. And once we had that data in place, we had those dashboards in place, and I can go and look her and do pivot tables about cohort retention, that then introduced the questions that Sprig solves. And so Got it's it. almost like a second order of mag a second order type of data set mm -hmm. where you look at your churn data, you drill in and see yoga studios are churning at a really high level. How do I figure out why these yoga studios are churning at a high level? that introduced the need and the problem that Sprig now introduced. And so when the analytic solutions really started to mature and become more ubiquitous, that's where I think the experience data started to become much more critical because those why questions started to emerge from that data. I guess they've all, always been critical, but now they're also like, it's you can, which why questions to prioritize, which are the more critical why questions because you can tie the, the critical why questions to the critical metrics really clearly. And the ROI of being able to answer the why questions is starting to become well-established, right? Okay, yes, the product strategy is really driving the revenue strategy. It's not separate. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think your point about the where in the maturity curve this is also makes a ton of sense. So great. So you have you have conviction, you have this insight, you are starting a company, you're a solo founder. What were the next few weeks and months like? How did you go about building your early team, putting kind of your pitch together? And what was some what was easy and what was hard? Yeah. It was definitely 2019 was very different than raising a, a round right now and getting started. And Right. The capital was not nearly as flowing, even I think in AI this year as it was then. 
And so I raised an angel round from friends and family. And as a solo founder, I actually raised around close to a million uh, to get started and then hired uh, full-time. Uh, so I hired some full-time folks. And the first person, I really broke the problem up into two different areas. I had a pretty big breakthrough starting Sprig. And this is a book that I, and concept that I recommend for anyone who's looking to really identify and start a company is called Outcome Driven Innovation. Mm -hmm. And the entire premise of the concept or the book by Tony Olwick, so you can look it up and read the book and it's very formative in starting Sprig, is that you want to look at, you want to talk to as many people as you can. And if you look at the Lenny Rachitsky series, you often get a, a hundred design partners and you talk to a hundred different yeah. potential customers. But what's interesting is that you look at the outcomes of what they're trying to solve. And you look at the outcomes they're looking to solve where they're unsatisfied with the outcome of how the tool is solving the outcome today. And you look for high important. And so you want to solve outcomes that are really important, but also when they're unsatisfied with. And at Sprig, what I realized, and to your point, there are a lot of tools out there, but there were no tools that was solving, collecting at scale, very large scale, thousands, tens of thousands of contextual survey responses, but also analyzing that survey data at a very large scale. And so the first hire to join me was a head of AI, and he's still here as our AI architect leading our AI vision. And I broke the, the problem up into scalable survey data collection and scalable survey data analysis into two separate jobs to be done. I hired him to solve the second one, AI analysis at scale. I hired another engineer to solve the first one of collecting the data at scale. And those two were each solving the different problems with that pre-seed round. And then we started to build around those two, but it was very much looking at what the user researchers are doing at Weebly of manually collecting the data with some in, very basic tooling, manually analyzing the data and seeing, can we actually automate this lower level type of activity? to free up these product teams from doing this very laborious manual data collection and data analysis. So answer your question, head of AI and then a full stack engineer. Makes sense. Now you obviously were, you had a product vision that was deeply rooted in your own personal experience. How did you go about thinking through, okay, what is it you want to validate? Like the early product, was it largely based on your personal experience or did you still try to explore maybe different types of product leaders? Do you, did you have any hypotheses you still needed to test before you built your minimum viable product? And if so, what were some of those questions that were on your mind? We did get some traction with small startups. So we had quite a few companies paying us small amounts of money. I was sending cold emails to white combinator companies, for example, of various sizes. We also had some what we call mid-market tech companies. So Code Academy was one of our first customers. And we also had some design partners that were what we call enterprise tech. And so Hotwire, Square, you know, Robinhood, all pre-launch. And what I did want to hone in was validate that assumption around that outcome-driven innovation process right. is that the unmet need in the market and the problem that is not solved right now is actually around the at scale and the, the high growth and at scale tech companies. And the trend that I saw is that the larger the company and the larger the user base, the more they're interested in Sprig. Mm -hmm. And so someone like Hotwire, who I had no connection to, spent close to six months with for an hour every week, helping shape and guide and build the Sprig product. Someone at the head of research at Robinhood invited me to the Robin Hood Menlo Park office and packed the room with 30 leaders across the entire product org of analytics and research and design and the head of product and said, I think this is interesting. I think this is something that we should consider for our growth at Robin Hood. This experience data is going to be critical for us to build a world-class product experience. And when I noticed that this contrast of these larger companies and people that I didn't know saying, let's set up another time next week. Let's keep the conversation mm -hmm. going. Here's my feedback. And I want to shape this product with you. 
it's not product market fit, but you start to get a pull and right. you get a, a right. pull from these businesses where the SMBs, there were definitely interest, but because of the alternatives, because they can talk to customers one-on-one, -on -one, right. candidly, there wasn't as strong of the need. And to your point, there are other solutions of the market, Typeform or Google surveys that are low cost or free that might be an adequate solution for an early stage startup. They have less product area and fewer customers. Both vectors magnify the, the size of the problem itself. That makes a lot of sense. I'm, I'm curious, were there any surprises for you? You went into this kind of having you know, a lot of clarity on having solved the problem yourself. Were there any surprises that were unexpected as you spent time with maybe even you know, bigger companies than you had worked at like Robinhood? In terms of surprises, I, I was going back to the last point of just their willingness to commit their time and started to realize that for a business, a person's time is more important than their money. Right. And you, as a consumer and someone who primarily had worked in the consumer space and working with small businesses, at Weebly, someone would gladly spend eight hours building a website from scratch and not pay someone $300 to build that website for them. Right. But if you look at these larger organizations, it's candidly not their money. It's right. a budget that they have, but they're also incredibly busy people. And so for those that are looking to sell to mid-market enterprise and larger companies, I think that should be to an extent. But the signal to look for is that the people who are willing to continue to spend that time with you, and I think the willingness to pay as you probably saw at Amplitude, will easily grow and change if you're solving a real problem. But the leading indicator is someone is willing to have that next call with you, that next meeting, and you don't have a personal connection with them. And that last part's really critical. Our friends and family and colleagues will spend all the time in the world helping us out, uh, but that's not any indicator, potentially a negative indicator that we're solving a real problem in the world. Makes sense. And what were like parts of the bitch that you face like more concerns or questions or skepticism around like the pain was really clear you have a lot of validation around the pain they are giving you very precious time bringing more people into the room perfect right what about the feedback on like the solution that you are building the going back to the hotware example the main challenge i was facing is that we had this incredible pull from these more mature companies but we were an early stage startup right? with at the time four or five people and at the time just under a million raised. And it was actually, how do we cross that bridge? Do we perhaps change our ICP down market mm -hmm. to help right. and then move up market in the future, which going back to what we discussed earlier, there is more, there is more competition down market. Mm -hmm. And so how much progress can you make? Can, can that be a distraction to your roadmap? And so I think it was getting not only customers to have that patience to help shape that product until they were willing to make that investment and try Sprig, but also getting and finding investors who are also willing to have that patience right? and say, we want to be committed to your vision and your founding premise and founding thesis for Sprig. So very fortunate to bring on Bill Trenchard from First Run Capital, who led our seed round in 2019, and also someone who had to work with companies like Looker to their exit to Google, and he was a C investor there. And so he had seen that path and that journey. And I think that's why we both felt like it'd be a really good investor founder fit, because right. I wanted someone who had a journey similar to Looker, and he had already seen, and I think just they're about to be acquired and you know, doing very well, or had just recently been acquired and had already seen that strong success and was willing to make that bet again. Makes sense. Could you walk us through the timeline for when you went from prototyping to like having, okay, this could work in production for a hot while? Like, how long did it take you to get to that? Okay, this product could actually be deployed for your ideal customer profile as opposed to the small startups that are not great customers, but give you love when you most need it. So the first customer that we did go live with, and it was critical that I didn't have any personal connections to the people that we worked with, was Square. And But again, no one that I had any connection with that was buying and paying us and right, right. paying us for the pilot, which I want to emphasize is critical for anyone who's 
not just selling to people that you've worked with and have a personal connection to. And they're willing to install Sprig in the product offering and run some surveys. And they did a paid pilot with us. And they had already spent several months up into the paid pilot. We got the paid pilot. We ran a paid pilot. It was phenomenally successful. And they're really one of the first true target companies in that mid-market enterprise P that said, we'll try this out. We'll do a paid pilot. We'll see how it goes. And because we, our goal is to build a more sophisticated at scale product offering for these more sophisticated businesses that we had to look at what's the smallest, it's almost the MVP of what cannot be done manually ourselves. Right. And so the only piece that we couldn't do ourselves is that SDK that had to go under us, our customer's product, but designing the surveys, the questions, design, adding the questions, configuring all the questions, the dashboard itself, the AI analysis, 90% of the product offering or how it appeared to them was all manual. We presented right. all the information in slide decks. We did all the analysis manually. We built all the surveys directly in the database. There's no way to build those in a self-serve manner. And when you're building for these larger companies, you have to look at what's the MVP that we can't do ourselves. And we just focus on that SDK and the ability right. to control the SDK manually. And I think the biggest learning lesson there, and I think also really relevant for founders, is it doing things that everyone knows the rule of doing things that don't scale in terms of sales and marketing and hiring and other processes, but also the more that you can do things that don't scale with your product is such a amazing learning opportunity that helped shape our V1 because right. we were doing so much else manually and we knew exactly what to build when it came time with the resources, the conviction, the, the capital, the headcount to go build but it was so clear on that product spec for the areas that we were doing ourselves for months and sometimes up to a year. And how old was Sprig when you did your paid pilot with Square? The pilot with Square was, we signed the official contract right at our seed round in the fall of 2019. Yeah. Got it. And you were user leap at the time. We were user leap at the time. And so when I started the company, you go to your domain provider, you type in, <laughs> right. you look at, I was looking at combining two words, which is the most common way to get those domain names and it was available and started with usually. So that was our first name. And uh, maybe it's a good kind of point to like transition to adding more uh, customers, right? Like you have a very clear product spec. You are able to like work with customers as big as Square and these larger design partners. How did you, how and when did you make the transition to, okay, I'm now going to focus a little less on the product development process and really go prospecting? And you close like all of the early customers yourself. What was your approach as like a first time seller, really? And how did you teach yourself how to go about doing founder selling? So I'd never worked at a company that had a salesperson. And <laughs> right. so it was uh, starting from zero on learning uh, sales. I was fortunate that uh, I come from a lineage of salespeople. And so I'd like to think there's a little bit of a head start, but I'd never actually seen it myself at a company that I worked at, being in the B2C and B2SMB space. And we were fortunate to have first round that was really helping build our pipeline. And what they were doing is they had someone at the firm that was providing intros to the first round community network. One of those was Code Academy, for example. And Dan, the product really connected with Dan Layfield, who was their director of growth at the time. And so if you don't, have, if you have an investor who can help make those connections, that's a great way. Those investor asks at the end of your investor update, making sure you're getting those warm intros to people in the investor network can go a long way. And if that's not something that is a possibility, I do think that either doing the SDR efforts yourself right. or having an SDR who can automate that outbound email process on your behalf. So you can give them a script, you can give them your LinkedIn right. login, you can give them an ICP. And the goal that you wanna look for is, can you get three to five meetings per week? 
And each meeting is a learning opportunity. Now we have Gong, you can record the calls. Back then, we didn't have that. And so it was taking notes and looking at the patterns at the end of every week of what was working and not working. And so the first thing was just getting, you know, those meetings on the calendar, different ways to do that. And then the sales process and the sales book that was super impactful for me. And I'm a reader. We'll get to the resources, I think, at the end, and I'll share some resources and books. But the sales book that was most helpful for me, and it's quite dated. Uh, so if anyone reads it, it's, it, it, it might feel a little dated, but the concepts are very helpful. And it's called, You Can't Teach a Kid to Ride a Bike at a Seminar. A bit of a mouthful, but you can't teach a kid to ride a bike at a seminar. And it's by uh, Sandler. And so he is considered one of the classic minds in the sales field. And it really helped break down sales into a process of decisions. And one of the key lessons that I learned in sales that pass on to any founder listening is that every meeting is a decision and you want to start every meeting saying, this is the decision we hope to make at the end of the meeting. And a getting to a signed contract is if it's SMB, it could be two to five meetings and two to five yeses for an enterprise contract. It could be uh, 20 to 30, potentially 15 yeses, but just focus on each meeting as start the first call, looking to understand whether we should book a full demo with other people at your team and the call. Hey, we just wrapped up. Want to check in as the question that we started with. I would, based on what I'm hearing from you, I would recommend we schedule that wider demo with your team. And then at the demo, starting with that prompt, ending that meeting with whatever that decision was. And if you can break down your sales process into a set of repeatable decisions for each meeting, it really took off the stress for me because I knew exactly where I stood with each product prospect. Makes but sense. it also broke down a lot of the stress for the prospect because they understood exactly where they were and what decision they had to make during that call. Makes sense. I love how methodical you are. I think one of the qualities you really need as a founder is the ability to learn because every six months you need to reinvent yourself as the company leader, as your company is growing fast. And that's the best case scenario is that you're painfully evolving with your company because it needs you to evolve and you're, you're clearly a learner. And I love how you separated out even the, the kind of uh, met, the methodology for like, how do you validate your product idea versus how do you build pipeline? And we actually uh, also have we work very closely with the founders we invest in to help them build pipeline. But we love to say before you have clarity on what to build, cold outreach is actually your best friend. Because mm -hmm. if we do warm introductions before you have clarity on what to build, you won't get the brutal feedback you need. You'll get a lot of nice feedback, people who don't want to hurt your feelings, people who don't want to weaken their relationship with the VC who invested in you and introduced you. And so you get a lot of mixed feedback, which is much worse than a clear no. Until you know what to build, I think cold outreach is your best friend. And if your messaging isn't working immediately, if you're not able to get time with strangers immediately, that you're not solving a problem they care about, that's the wrong time to ask for warm intros. And the right time is, okay, we have a very clear thesis. You're building in this direction. Now I just need to meet a lot of people who fit this profile. And that's when you use your network, you lean on your investors, and it's very important to get the timing right when you shift into that mode. And I love that you all, you already knew that coming in. And I think maybe switching gears a little bit to the fact that you had an early thesis around AI. So you started the company, this was you know, pre-GPT 3.5, which I think in 2020 was a huge turning point in the world of what you can do with unstructured data, uh, especially when it comes to uh, language. Uh, I'm curious, like, how did you think about your AI strategy before 2020 when you started the company versus once the LLM, like, out-of-the-box APIs were available and potentially like the cost of developing an AI native product might look extremely different when you have industry grade APIs and models available. I'm curious kind of 
what that switch looked like for you? It was certainly a very early bet. At the time, the largest companies in our category, Qualtrics, Medallia, they were using word clouds. And it had right. to be a literal string matching of you say price. And, yes. I, uh, I say price and you say price. And we, we'll, do a word, we'll do a bubble on the screen right. for price. But I say cost and you say price. And you're in the cost category and someone else right. is in the price category. And so we are very early to what I think is now just emerging as something that's becoming more common. And going back to those, the outcome driven innovation framework around the outcomes that were important to the high growth and at scale companies, one of the really critical outcomes was the ability to analyze that data at scale. And the other thing that validated that is that when we were manually doing we're going to be only built the SDK to start. It's 5% right. of the product. We only just focused all of our efforts there. And then when Kevin, head of AI, I wanted to validate before he joined that there is value in grouping responses into themes, even if there are no overlapping words or phrases. And so you say it's too expensive and you say, I say, I can't afford this price. Grouping those into the same theme is something that had never been done before. And when we were building out those decks for companies like Square, they found incredible value in not just the feedback and the data that was collected from the surveys, but quantifying the data and saying 12% of the people in the survey cited price as a concern. 33% of people said adding a product is very difficult or cumbersome. And it was really in the analytics around their survey data where we had the big breakthroughs with those early pilot customers. And so when Kevin came on board, it was just, this hasn't been done before. And you, right. you're the first one who's gonna have to do it. And we're this seed stage company and we're gonna have to see what we can do. And so we started with the open source Google models. At the time it was BERT. And we started to build our own in-house tooling. And we hired our own, we tested different human loop processes around how to really check the data and right. see whether the AI was accurate or not. And we started probably around 50% efficacy. And so there's a little bit of work on our research team uh, behind the scenes and the dashboard reviewing and checking and tweaking all the AI analysis. But there was so much skepticism at the time around AI is that we actually had to guarantee our customers that we will review every single response that was collected by an right. expert user research team. And we had to build a whole set of administrative capabilities behind the scenes for researchers who we brought on to review and check all the data to review and check all the data very fast and ways <laughs> to automate and just multi-select and quickly move and break themes up and combine themes very quickly. And so to your point, it was, it, it was a fairly large investment but it was something that allowed us to bring in these customers and something that was very unique compared to the other analysis technologies available. And for, for us to really solve the, complete the vision, and at least paint the picture of what we want to do long-term, we felt it was really critical to use AI in that way and that had never been done before. And how has that changed? So has that, how has it been pre and post chat GPT launching? It's exciting for us because our goal at Sprig is to always be at the forefront of what you can do with AI in the field of product experience and more broadly sentiment and what, how people perceive product experiences. And at the very beginning, we were considered the leader with the text analysis that we had done. But there are so many other things that we wanted to do, but right. these models could only do very specific tasks with huge amounts of training data with, and so when these new models started to emerge, we actually, at the beginning of this year, switched over to GPT-4. And so we're now using the learnings we had for the past three years. We migrated GPT-4. We're able to, we're still reviewing a little bit, but it's more ad hoc and more passively. But what's exciting for us is that it's all, nearly all real time, very in the moment. It's far more accurate. We can get descriptions and summaries of the data. But the biggest thing for us is it's opened up the possibilities of what you can do with AI. And it's just a few months ago, we just launched the ability to, where the entire survey data is ingested into GPT-4. 
and you can actually ask questions about your data. And so correlations right. and trends. And so the possibilities, all the things that we had to put on the shelf in 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, we're now immediately jumping on or immediately implementing or immediately executing on. And so we see it very much as this race implement these different ideas that we've I've always wanted to do, that we always want to expand beyond that original version of the AI implementation. Got it. And, and I'm, I would assume your bios are a lot less skeptical yes. today than they were maybe <laughs> as of September 2022 versus now. Very different, right? Yes. Now seeing is believing. Awesome. I think I'm curious, how have you approached learning and growing as a CEO, especially I think since you're clearly being so intentional about it and you are a solo founder. Like I think it's kudos, first of all. And you have gone through a very challenging four years for any startup founder, right? There's been a pandemic, there's a huge like market bull run followed by an immediate big crash and software budgets getting slashed everywhere. And now there's like World War Three on the horizon. Like what... Uh, how have you approached growing as a CEO and also learning what is it that your team needs to feel a sense of stability and momentum over time? I've always took it, and a lot of people ask as a solo founder, how do you do it emotionally? How do you do it mentally? I could, a lot of people tell me, like, I could never do it as a solo founder. And I think for me, it's just taking it week by week, month by month, and just look, focusing on what's in front of you. I'll, Enjoy that moment when I can think long term and think about next year or next quarter. But you know, I think day to day is just looking at, you know, what you want to tackle that day, what you want to tackle tomorrow and next week. And really look at it as from looking at hindsight, probably three different evolutions. I think the first one was really as a manager. And so for any founder who has extensive management experience, you're off to a great start. <laughs> I, I had very little management experience before starting Sprig. And so I had to learn how to manage at first a team of four and a team of 10. And then I think it was like maybe 12 direct reports at one time in the early days. And then you start to get to a certain size where you can't manage everybody and you have managers and you have managers and that's where we're at now. And you have to really grow as a leader and you have to think about how to inspire people and motivate people. And as a manager, you're, work, you're managing managers who are managing other people. And so you have to think about how to work through managers. And so it's more advanced the management concepts. And then I think more recently in the past 12 months, it has been about learning about how to be a CEO and even thinking about some of the, even the racism that we experienced that was very prevalent a couple of years ago. That's a moment as a CEO where you have to step up. You have to provide that leadership. When we had to look at a very volatile past 12 months as a company, we came out of a period and one of Someone on my team can said, hey, I, you really stepped up leadership with a capital L. The team needed a CEO to really be that strong voice, that strong person in the room and hit me that, oh, you know, I, that was, uh, <laughs> got through that and the team really right. respected that and it stepped in as a CEO. Um, as and that it made a difference for you to even just have a voice, even if mm -hmm. these are like massive systemic issues. I think it's easy to say we're not going to be able to solve the root problem. So let's just not talk about it. Mm -hmm. That then creates this like vacuum and which gets filled with anxiety. Right. Exactly. And so I think anyone who's running a company right now over the past 12 months is probably where you learn the most as a manager or a leader or a CEO, whatever position you're in. And so it's certainly been a moment where I've learned to embrace the constraints of efficiency embrace the challenges that we're all enduring right now. And just some of the resources just to, to break it down, and maybe this is helpful for others, is the two, again, I read a lot of books, and so I'll just cherry pick the few that have been yes, most please. impactful, is the author Jim Collins yeah. has, is a Stanford professor, and he deeply studies what a successful company, the traits of successful companies over a hundred year periods, very long periods of time, and looks at periods of hyper growth versus comparison companies that don't do as well. And his books have probably had the biggest impact on my growth as a CEO. And the two in particular are 
Beyond Entrepreneurship 2.0 and Good to Great, but he has a whole series of other books as well. And he really unpacks something like a vision and how to craft a mission statement and how to craft goals and how to inspire and motivate people. And so his series is one that I've read several times to really deeply understand how to build an iconic company like Walmart or IBM, or he talks a lot about Sony, for example, and what their formative years or periods of hyper growth look like. And so that's definitely two books that I recommend for any entrepreneur and founder. And even back to the earliest days, the values, for example, and digging into Nordstrom, they have a such strong value system that someone who doesn't fit their values often will quit within three months. And they see that as a positive sign of having a strong culture. Mm -hmm. And you start to learn how to build a distinct culture that it's almost like a new hire is like an organ. And are they accepted or are they rejected? And really leaning into that and realizing not everyone is going to be a fit for your culture. And that goes back to just some of the CEO learnings that I've had of developing a culture, developing people. And most recently has been really understanding and digging into the learnings of Frank Slootman. So the legendary growth stage CEO in Silicon Valley with Data Domain, ServiceNow, and now Snowflake. And his focus on execution has been so interesting for me to follow. I consider myself more of a Michael Porter, strategy, strategic memo type person in the early years of Sprig and pre-Sprig, right. but I've really shifted over the past one to two years and very recently because of the Frank Slootman's writings of focusing so much on execution and seeing my role as CEO as really chief execution officer and how can we move faster? How can we narrow our focus? How can we amp it up here at Sprig? Awesome. What an absolutely wonderful note to end on. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. This was really valuable and I love what an amazing journey you have taken Sprig on. Kudos on all the progress and I'm sure a lot of listeners will be trying Sprig as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Awesome. It's really great to be on the podcast and you're right. We have a, a generous free plan for all the early stage startups and founders out there. And so sprig.com and slash sign up to create your free account in product survey, session replay. We also have a uh, discount for anyone who's interested in one of our paid plans, sprig.com slash unusual. So sign up, check it out, you get 10% off. And if there's any questions you, about anything I've covered today, I'm on Twitter. So slash Ryan Glasgow. Love to see you there. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Thank you, Ryan. All right. Thank you. You've been listening to the Startup Field Guide with Sandhya, an unusual ventures podcast. Stay connected with us by subscribing to the show in your favorite podcast player. If you liked what you heard, please rate our show and help us reach more aspiring founders with lessons on how to find product market fit. Thanks for listening. Until next time.